Hello everybody, it's Tony Arnold here for Central Heights Baptist Church bringing you a Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night message. Tonight we'll be looking in Romans chapter 9 as we kind of keep working our way through, the, uh, through this book. And we'll do the whole chapter of 9 in the first, I think, four verses of chapter 10 because it kind of ties back in uh, to what we're going to talk about here tonight. Uh, Deborah and I just want to say how, how much fun we had uh, this uh, the the first, uh, it's not the first Easter we got to spend with you guys, but it's the first one we got to see people. Uh, because, uh, you know, last one we were still only doing online things, and um, and we're do, still doing that, but we're, we're getting to see some people in person, too. Uh, we had a great time at the, at the uh, Easter egg hunt Saturday, uh, and then we had, a, I thought we had a great service Sunday morning, and uh, hopefully uh, you got a lot out of it, too, but uh, we had a we had a great time fellowshipping and, and uh, worshiping our Lord and Savior, our risen Savior, uh, on Resurrection Day. Uh, so, um Thank you guys. It was just an awesome service I thought we had uh, Sunday morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to kind of dig in to Romans chapter 9. Uh, Father God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what all you've done for us. Thank you again for a risen uh, Savior, Father, for an empty tomb. And uh, Father, just uh, help us remember uh, what our Savior has done for us, uh, what he can do in us, uh, and that uh, if we uh, we are willing to submit, uh, to what he can do in us, then we can be a uh, powerful part of your story. Uh, Father, that points people towards you. You know, Father, help us to do that. Help us to grow, and as we learn more about your word, just take us out of it, uh, make it all about you. you know, Father, we just want to thank you again for all you've done for us and for what all you will do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look in here in Romans chapter 9 and then talk about it, and it's going to give us, it basically talks about the, the same subject all through here. Uh, through here, but it's a great promise for us, and uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, he's, uh, Paul speaking, he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish, or for I could wish, that I myself were accursed or cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and, uh, and from their race, according to, the, according to the flesh, it is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though that the word of God has failed. For not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel, not all children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the offspring, or excuse me, for this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived uh, children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done neither good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. <clears throat> what, shall we see, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says uh, to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me, why does he still find fault? For, for who can resist his will? But who are you, old man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded uh, say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if uh, God, desiring to show his wrath, and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even to whom he is called, not from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who is not believed I will call beloved. And in the very place where it is said to them, you are not my people, and they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, through the number of sons of, uh, through the numbers, though the number of sons of Israel 
can be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, but if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we'd have not, we, would have not been like, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in re reaching the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were based on works. Those who stumbled over the stumbling stone, it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have the zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. So there's a lot of things going on here, but they all kind of tie in uh, to the same idea. But in, in Romans chapter 9, he starts off and he's, he's telling us... Uh, about the Holy Spirit, that we have the Holy Spirit with us now. Uh, and, he's, and he's saying uh, that if he could be cut off from Christ, he would just so other people would know Christ. Now, here's the thing, and it, this is showing a, a great kind of love Paul has. And we know from the scripture we read before in Romans 8 that you, you're not cut off. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't really happen. Uh, but he's showing such a great love for them. He's saying, if I had to be separated so you wouldn't have to be separated from God, I'd do it. Now, I want you to think about how big and deep a commitment that is. He's so worried about what other people, other people coming to know Christ, that if he had to be abandoned himself, he would be willing to endure it so that other people would know who Jesus is. Now, the beauty is we won't have to endure that. We don't have to be cut off from Christ so that someone else uh, can know Christ. But he's also going to make a point here uh, about what we call election. Uh, about uh, a lot of people call it predestination and the reason i think that it's so big of a point here is because we don't you know we, we like to think that that we come to know christ that we found this knowledge of christ the holy spirit has revealed it to us so we are chosen people uh, we get to be part of the same chosen people that god had from the beginning because he had a people that he did choose and we get to be adopted into that family but it was not of our work that it happened. It was God's work. God did it. God did the saving. We didn't save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can't work our way to it. God did all the work. So he's trying to get that point made, uh, across to him here. Uh, but then he makes another point to him <clears throat> because uh, it was something that's going to come up uh, also in Scripture as, as Paul and Peter had this uh I had a big argument. There was, there was a big ordeal that they had. And, uh, Peter had started telling the Gentiles of, about Christ, uh, but then he started leave, uh, living more according to like the Jewish customs and was kind of leaving the Gentiles out uh, of the spreading of the gospel. And, and Paul confronts him on this, and he's like, uh, what are you doing? Uh, why are we doing this? He said, uh, we know that, yes, you know, it does say in Scripture right here in the Romans, right in the very, uh, first chapter, I think it's around, uh, the 16th verse, it, it tells us that God say, came to say first the Jew and then the Gentile, but the Gentiles are part of it. Uh, the beautiful part about this for us is I'm not Jewish, and as far as I know, I don't have any Jewish uh, bloodlines that, that I can really tie into. Uh, we've done a little bit of uh, family research, but we haven't done, uh, you know, the extensive stuff that, that a lot of people are good at go and do now. Uh, but as far as I know, I'm a Gentile. I'm not of God's chosen people. That uh, ultimately, I think we all kind of come from the from the same batch. When you boil it all down, we ultimately come from Adam and Eve, and then from Noah and his family. But what we're really trying to say here is that if we're Gentiles, then we could have been excluded from what God really did, but He chose not to do that. Because would it have been wrong if, if Jesus had died on the cross, but he only died for the Jews? Because that was God's chosen people? It wouldn't have been right, because God has established what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. But it shows how merciful he is that we could be part of it too. And a lot of people, they question, is one of the things they go after and they attack 
especially of, of the God that we believe in in Christianity, is they say, well, how can a good and just God and a merciful God ever send anybody to hell? Well, here's the deal. God doesn't send you there. You send yourself there. Our sin is what is, is, is why we have to suffer through any kind of punishment, the punishment of death, the punishment of hell, the punishment of being separated from God. It is our sin. It is not God's responsibility to fix our sin, but it shows how merciful and good that he is that he would do that. And if you think about it this way, if, if I know about somebody and, and their bills are not getting paid and their power and their water and everything's fixed to be shut off, is it my responsibility to pay their bill for them? It wouldn't be my responsibility, per se, to pay that bill for them, but I should have compassion for them, and if I have the means to be able to do that, I should help them, right? Because they owe a debt they can't pay. Now, this is what God has done for us. I know it's a very simplified version, and it's nowhere near uh, as big of a magnitude as what really happened for us, especially what happened for us on the cross. But we owed a, we owed a debt. We can't pay it. We have no means of being able to pay it. But Jesus did it for us. And if we place our trust in him because he's revealed the truth to us, then we can be saved and we can be forgiven. We can be made right with God. We can have an eternal salvation secured through Jesus Christ. And then it tells us some, it tells us uh, some things in here. It talks about Jacob and Esau. And one of the uh, things he said in there is uh, that he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. And, and he's showing his, uh, his sovereignty by doing this because if you look at Jacob and Esau and you really read through the story and we read through it and you know, try to understand it with the, with the human minds that we have, what well, didn't Jacob trick Esau into getting all this stuff? Didn't he deceive his own brother to be able to take his blessing and his birthright? Now, his mother was in on this. She's the one that got him to do it. But God said he loved him. And some of that time, some of that is hard for us to understand. But here's what we do know about that: God had a plan, and He chose to use him as part of His plan. There's, there's a lady in the, in the Old Testament named Rahab that is God used her as part of her plan. She was a prostitute. She wasn't someone that we would look highly upon. She'd be someone that you know. I, I hate to say it like this, but if she walked in our church today and we knew who she was and what she did we probably look down on her. But God used her as part of the plan. She's mentioned in Jesus' lineage that God in his sovereignty has a plan. But it also comes in there and it's something that the book of Job does a great job of explaining too. Is, uh, if anybody ever had any, any uh, right to be angry for what has happened to them, I think it was Job. Uh, it tells us in Scripture that Job was righteous. That he was a good man, that he was doing what he was supposed to do, and then he lost his, uh, his children, and then he lost his wealth, and he lost his health. All to prove a point to Satan. And even his friends turned on him. His own wife was just telling him just to curse God and die. And then Job, in frustration, cried out to God. And he's like, you know, the, I wish I'd never even been born. It's like, this is unbelievable. I don't know why you would let me go through all this. Long. And then God finally kind of answers him, and, he's, and he, he's very blunt with the answer. And he asks him, who are you to question me? And if we really think about that, uh, we're pretty bold in our society today. Uh, we're really too bold in our society because we're trying to question God. And I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have questions. Uh, because I think we have a patient and merciful God. But when he with if he withholds an answer, why are we why are we trying to, to go after him like we don't understand that he's got a better plan than we do? And that's one of the points he's trying to get across here. That even though we don't always understand, and there's some things in scripture that are confusing is why God did it that way. Why he chose that person. Why would he say that he loved Jacob and he hated Esau? When both of them had sinned, well, we, do we truly trust God? Do we trust him that he would be merciful and show us mercy 
and that his mercy would be shown to the world that sinners like us could be saved. It's a beautiful thing that we get to see in Scripture. He also is getting his point across that, 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 that he had a chosen people, but even these Israelites, even these Jews that were part of his chosen people, some of them weren't living according to the way he called them to live. That their hearts were hardened. They were living according to different ways. And he said they were even trying to earn their way to God by just through following the, uh, just following the law. Uh, but I think it's clear now throughout Scripture that the law it wasn't just about keeping a set of rules. It was teaching us a mindset uh, that we need to have to be even able to, to follow rules, to be able to love God and to love each other. Because if that part is right, all the other Ten Commandments fall into place. If we truly love God and we truly love each other. Now, the, the way that we view love today, I think, can be skewed. I think we got to get our definition of love should come from Scripture. If we say God is love, let's look at God's definition throughout Scripture of what love truly is. Love doesn't just tell me that everything's good and okay. Sometimes love has hard conversations. And that's not easy. But if we, sometimes we have to hold people accountable. I've had people tell me some things across, you know, over the years that have really hurt my feelings. But some of it's been the best advice I could ever get. Even though it was devastating at the time. Love is a lot more complicated than just saying, well, because I love you, you get to do whatever you want. That's not what, that's not what love is. It's not what it is at all. It tells the scripture that love is patient and is kind, it is good, it is just. It does not fail. But it's also going to hold us to a standard. Not just so we keep laws and keep rules, but so that we learn what it means to love God and love each other because God loves us, he holds us to that standard. But don't we want him to? Don't leave us to ourselves to go and be rebellious against him, but to teach us what it truly means to be one of his children. It's a beautiful thing that we get to be, uh, be uh, such a big part of. And then he kind of goes back into scripture and, he, and he's telling them, and here's one of the beautiful things that this uh, people of that time probably did not understand, but when we read the whole uh, story of Scripture, we can see he quotes some verses out of Hosea, and he says, uh, "Those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her uh, who has not, who is not beloved, I will call beloved." So he's saying, "There's people out there; they're not part of the chosen people that, that I have." But but if we really look at it, God's used people that were outside of the Jews, outside of the Israelites throughout scripture they were kind of adopted into the family already uh, that God used them in powerful ways but he's saying here what's ultimately going to happen through what Jesus did for us too that even bigger door is going to be open that all who come to know Jesus all of this uh, elect and that's who we are as Christians we get, we're, we're, we're very privileged to, that God will call our name and I think he's it's much bigger than uh, just uh, adopting some man made doctrine on that but I think we have to be very biblical in how we believe that. But we're privileged that God would reveal the truth to us through the Holy Spirit. And like I said, it's like he's called her name the same way he did Mary Magdalene. And we realize who he is. We know who Jesus is now. That we get to be part of his family. Now we are called beloved. When before we were wretched. We were separated from him. And then later on, he's quoting from, from, um, from Isaiah. And he tells us um, that, uh, that he's laid a, a stumbling block in Zion. He's basically talking about the law that people don't get it. People don't understand. It. Can't work your way to it. Work's already been done. We trust in him. We follow him. But he's done all the hard work. He's done all the heavy lifting. And then he tells us right here at the end that, uh, uh, again, that the law is not what, what he's really searching after. He's looking for people that are seeking after righteousness, that are seeking after him, that are seeking about what the law is really about, not just to follow a set of rules. And that's what we all get to be part of. And see, this reason he's laying this out here is because this was going to be a tremendous hindering uh, or hindrance uh, for the Gentiles to become Christians 
Because there's a lot of scriptures devoted about circumcision. The reason he devotes so much talk about circumcision, he's like, it's not just about following rituals. It's not just about following the, the rules. So you have to do this to be a Christian or this to be. He's like, it's not about that at all. We have to love God and love people. We have to believe in who Jesus is and follow him. That's what we need to do. And if we do that and we're really seeking after him, everything else is going to start to take care of itself. Another thing that I'd add to that I think is so important, especially in our day to day, and it was especially important then too, because uh, the reason all this is being written is so that we would understand what Scripture really is trying to teach us. We'd have good uh, theology, a uh, good understanding of who God is or what our responsibility that is too. But because of so many different false doctrines that are available today, just like they were then, I think it's important for us to know Scripture, to be uh, to be people that study scripture, to really under, try to understand what God is really teaching us through it, to really get in depth with it. And all of us can learn more. I can learn a lot more too. There's a lot I don't know yet. But it's also important for us to pray, to talk to God, to have a communication with him. And it's also important for us to worship him, to proclaim his goodness. Because I want you to think about it this way. If we're worshiping him, we're proclaiming how great he is. That's why I think church is important. Because it's something that we do together. We're coming together to worship. If we're worshiping, if we're talking to him through prayer, if we're studying his word, we're, con we're in constant communion with God. And when we're in constant communion with God, he's continually teaching us. It's about loving him and about loving each other. And when we do that, we don't understand just the law. We understand the purpose for the law, which was what everybody missed out on. We're just doing it so that we can say, look at me, I follow all these rules. But we get to be adopted all together into that family because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's the Jews and the Gentiles. So I have some questions for us tonight to really think about it. Uh, one of the questions is, um, is, is what are we doing as far as being obedient to Christ? Are we following rules? Or are we seeking after God? When I say seeking after God, I mean, are we truly loving him? Or are we truly loving his people? Because that's what we should really be pursuing. If we're pursuing that, we're going to fall in line with what Scripture teaches us about even the rules. But it's not about following the rules. And if we're doing that, uh, if we're not doing those things, what is holding us back? Is it uh, a checklist? Is, is, do we want our faith to be like that? Because it's not. Is it, is it a lack of faith? Is it, do we, is it the, or are we truly believing? Or is there parts of our life that we just want to hold on to that we're having trouble completely surrendering? What is holding us back from truly seeking God? And then, simply, who are we telling about what Jesus has done for us? Even if we believe in election, I believe it is our responsibility as people that know Christ to still spread the gospel because I think we get to be part of his story and God may be using the Holy Spirit through what we say and through how we act to reach other people. I believe he is using the Holy Spirit to do that. So we need to live in such a way that other people can see that Jesus is real through us. Some people will reject it. We never know who it might mean the world to. We never know who God might be speaking through. The Holy Spirit may be revealing that truth through so that they know Jesus personally. So let's make sure we're doing that. We're living according to what he's called us to do. If we're not, then we're finding out the reason we're not and giving it over to God and that we're telling other people about it. We love you guys. We're praying for you, and we hope to see you soon.